Hello and welcome to Tomlin's Harmonica Podcast, where I'll be hanging out with players and teachers and having conversations loosely based around harmonica. When I asked my students who they wanted me to chat to on the podcast, today's guest kept coming up. His career has seen him busking in Harlem, touring around the world, teaching thousands of harmonica students on YouTube, releasing solo records, writing books, and teaching English and Southern Studies at the University of Mississippi. And on a personal note, I wouldn't even be playing harmonica, let alone teaching it, if it hadn't been for his videos. He is Adam Gusso. Welcome to the show, Adam. Thanks, Tomlin. Great to, great to be here, coming to you from my back, my, uh, my back porch in Oxford, Mississippi. Excellent. So uh, how are you doing? Uh, well, I'm doing about as well as, you know, I, I, my, my day gig is I'm a professor at the University of Mississippi. And of course, we went online. We were forced to basically completely revamp courses at, at, the, at the midterm point. And I probably, I thought about this, you know, I'm in a department of maybe 30 English professors. I probably had more accumulated video time than all of them put together from the YouTube thing. And yet still, to translate, you know, a lecture that I might have given in person where I'm playing video clips in person to something online is very is completely different. So we're getting kind of near the end of the academic year. And so from my perspective as a, as a time thing, the way somebody who's about ready to hit the road as a musician, you know, when the summer touring season comes, I'm sort of about ready for the academic year to be over. Mm-hmm. And we're just kind of hanging on. There's that that hang on thing. So we're almost there. It, One it more must- week of classes, you know. Yeah. It must have really thrown um, students who are at a kind of important point in their university career, like kind of finals and things. How, how's that working? Well, I think it's terribly hard for, I mean, it's hard for everybody in a sense. And, and so, you know, I didn't know the difference between synchronous and asynchronous in that we're like, do I have a class at the same time that I used to have it, but now everybody has to sign in on Zoom and take it? You know, do we do that or do we do asynchronous where people sign on and, and watch, or just watch a video that you've done. I think, so that whole element's hard, but I think it's the people who were seniors, mm-hmm. who are about to graduate, who wanted that moment with the parents and grandparents on graduation day and with their friends and they're hanging out. The whole undergraduate, like polishing off the, the end of your four years of college or five years, whatever it's been, and they don't get that. And I, and I feel, same thing with college, you know, with college kids everywhere in America, and I, I don't know how the term works in the UK, but that's sort of really hard for them, I think. So yeah. so they've got the blues in some sense, even if they don't know it. <laughs> yeah, they no, do. I, I can imagine. But in, in a way, I mean, it's kind of to put a positive spin on, on some of this stuff. Um, I feel a, a lot of industries like education are, are probably going to benefit massively from kind of espousing these new technologies and, and moving more and more online and having access to, to extra technology. Uh, what, how do you feel about that? Well, it's interesting. I mean, I, um, I have a couple of teaching assistants, TAs, in uh, a, an American literature survey that I'm doing. And they, one of them was talking to me about how some of this, they have, they're doing quizzes every week, and there's sort of a, a, a board, a forum that they post uh, a response to for the reading. And she said, you know, there were students who weren't just doing what they were required to do on the response thing, but they were kind of continuing to dialogue with each other. And she said she'd never seen that. And I thought, wow, and I'd never used a discussion board in my classes. So, so I, there may well be. I think we always have to anticipate this. And actually, I'll make a, a segue. The, you know, the, that old thing where the Chinese character for crisis also equals opportunity, the idea that in every moment of disarray, there's potentially some something that really great that could come out of it. I'm going to give you a great example. In, in, the, in the early winter, like January, February of 2007, I was uh, a distance runner and I was in really good shape. And I went and ran a 10K out, out in Alabama and came back with a wrenched hamstring. And I couldn't run for three months and I was going crazy. So I began to investigate YouTube. <laughs> and that was when I uploaded, February 22nd, 2007, uploaded my first YouTube video. Which was actually, it's not available. It's all, It's about. It's called my blue car, Mississippi blue car. I've I've put it on unlisted so that nobody can can find it because I it was just an experiment to sort of brag on my custom painted car. Number zero 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 was that video that you know that I put up where I say I'm going to give away all that I know and and I and, and a whole business ended up coming out of that. A whole internet business. It was. It was the, a moment when I was thought, God, it's the end of the world. I'm a runner and I can't run. My hamstring will never be well. It eventually got well. 
with some medical interventions. And by the time I was able to run again, I had a business that transformed and, and, and a sort of web presence that has paid out over, or played out over the last 13 years. So I would encourage everybody who's listening to this, whether they're blues harmonica player or not, to, to be thinking with a really open mind and say, is there something here that positive, hugely positive that could potentially come out of this, whether it's going into the woodshed and practicing like crazy, you know, and so that when this all lifts a year from now or six months or whatever it's going to be, you're, you're a different player. I mean, I think that's one of the most constructive things people can do. Um, but I, yeah, that's sort of where my, where my thinking has been on this. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm definitely of the mindset of kind of spotting opportunities from, from crisis. And yeah, I, I've been woodshedding like mad, which has been great. Um, and and I, I've, I've got a kind of a similar uh, origin story um, hmm. about, uh, about injury leading to um, kind of career shifts. But I was a guitarist and I was starting to kind of get my first kind of proper paid work and things. And then I, I got quite serious mm. tendonitis in both my wrists uh -huh. um, and had to take 18 months off from playing. And musicians can't not make noise. You know, it's uh, we're, we're, right. we have to have that outlet. And so that's why I started playing harmonica. Um, and I don't think, I, you know, I, I don't think I could have had the same level of career as a guitarist um, that, that I've kind of found in harmonica. Uh, and at the time it, it was just kind of second best and I wasn't very happy about it, but, but now I'm, I'm really pleased to be doing what I do. So yeah, there's, there's a lot in those, those moments that feel quite, quite, uh, sad at the time. And then you look back and think, wow, that was, that was pivotal. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, for me, the, the, uh, the earliest, this started very early for me. Um, in, in the spring of 2017, I was able to drive at night for the first time. I turned, sorry, not 2017, in the spring of uh, 1975, I turned 17 years old and I could go from driving during the day to driving at night. And I ended up taking what was, th what was then my first girlfriend to a show at a local community college, uh, the Rockland Community College, um, at, it's up downstate New York. And, and it was the Jay Giles, it was James Cotton opening for the Jay Giles band. <laughs> and I had been listening to 100% Cotton. So Cotton had recorded this album, you know, the year before, and he was out touring this album with Creeper Creeps again and all these incredible things. And then the Jay Giles Band and Magic Dick in 1975 when they were big. Um, and, and that was the night that my first girlfriend broke up with me, said, we're, we're through, it's not working. And I'm sitting, I, I remember sitting in the front row and I'm watching what's going on on stage and going, incredible, like apocalypse now for a 17-year-old young harmonica guy. I remember taking my A harp and going to the men's bathroom, like taking a break from the girlfriend who's breaking up with me. I'll, I'll be back, you know, and going to the men's bathroom, running the, I've never told this story, but sort of, I used to soak my harps then. So running that A harp underneath the water and sort of blasting some stuff. And there was all the guys kind of, the way they would at a concert, kind of, um, so some guys are at the urinal, some guys are washing their hands. And I'm just like this poor teenage kid with a broken heart wailing on harp you know, worst moment, best moment. How about that? I mean, if that's not the blues, I don't know what is. And it's, that's, that's where it all started for me. There've been many such moments like that. That's we brilliant. can talk about them if you want, but no, yeah. that, that's, that's a good story. It's funny. You, you mentioned, yeah. uh, soaking your harps. Am I, am I remembering this correctly? I, I remember reading, uh, was it Busker's Holiday? Uh, mm -hmm. did you soak your harps in red wine? Is that, is that a, is that part of that? <laughs> no, that that was probably an invention. I, I I certainly drank a lot of red wine, so in metaphorical terms, it was sort of symbolic terms. It was pretty true that I, that was a. Uh, I mean that 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 novel was was based on a, a many things, and it was most primarily based on the summer of 1984 when I went off to Europe as somebody whose girlfriend of five years had just left him. My second girlfriend left me in a more painful way than the first girlfriend, and. Um, and and but it was also based on on a guy that I ended up hooking up with in New York named Bill Taft, um, who's actually a kind of an underground thing in in um, in the Atlanta blues scene and I, the Atlanta uh, underground music scene. Um, and I sort of imagined suppose that he was a crazy guy. And I said, imagine if that first summer when I took that trip and I took had a long moment where I left a buddy behind and kind of went went rogue for about a week and a half and then showed up in an Italian hotel room. But I said, imagine if 
Bill and I had done that whole thing together. Like what would have happened? Cause he was crazy. And I try, and I just, the novel invented that. And, and I think it came alive when he, when he came into the scene. I don't know if Busker's Holiday, by the way, is available over there, but i um, happy to have you talk about it because it was, it was my exp- immersion experience in the Parisian and then European blues scene that really transformed me from a former graduate student into somebody who was completely committed to getting really good on the instrument. Um, it took a, a while for all of that to happen, but the commitment, the total soul deep spiritual commitment, which every player who becomes something has at some point, whether it started really young, not everybody knows. At, but there's a moment for many of us, I think, where you suddenly know this is what you're put here to do and you, and you, and you do it like that. Other things may come along, but, but that moment was there for me. And uh, it was Europe, it was Paris. It was on the, in front of the Centre Georges Pompidou where I you know, sort of realized what you could do. <laughs> so. There, there is a song in there, right? Right, it's kind of writing itself. Um, so, your trip yeah. to Europe did that? Uh-huh. Did that precede uh, Harlem busking days? Yeah. So, and actually, I don't know if any of your um, viewers. I don't know if you've seen the Satan and Adam documentary. Is that whether I've, it's out? I've there? not seen it yet. No, but uh, it is on. It's on the watch list. So I don't know if it's even available over there. It may be. I'm not. I'm not 100 percent sure. But there's a. The documentary starts with me talk with with sort of young Adam going to Harlem. He's lost a girlfriend. He goes to Harlem, and and suddenly there's the greatest gig of your life. You know, it's Mr. Satan. And in reality, two and a half years went by between the girlfriend leaving in the spring of '84 and me running into Mr. Satan in the fall of '86. And so it was summer of '84. I went to Europe for the first time, not really knowing I was going to become a busker, if you will, a sort of, it was an impromptu thing, no amp, no song list, just kind of jamming with people. And then I sort of, that played out over the next couple of years. And I, by the summer of 85, I mean, I went back to Europe again, visited a girlfriend that I'd made there. And I, I, um, and then I tried to write a novel about it and it didn't work. It took many years to get that right. I went back in, and then in the summer of 85, I ran into my teacher, Nat Riddles, who's not mentioned in the Satan and Adam documentary, a, a black New Yorker who was six years older than me, who like, boy, did I get lucky. And I got lucky twice in my life with mentors. And he was playing on the street that summer uh, of 85. And I just followed him around and he took me under his wing. I was his protege, kind of. And he showed me stuff and bragged on me and let me sit in. Here's the mic. And I played through his mouse amp while he was sitting there watching and going, that's my boy, all that kind of stuff. And then I hooked up with Bill, Bill Taft. And then another guitar player in the spring of 86, Bill Collins, who still is in Paris, bad boy, Billy Collins. I mean, like I took him over there and, and he never came back literally almost <laughs> like he's, he's, he's a big deal on the streets in Paris, Bill, Billy Collins. Um, and we just had a great time for a couple of months also fought a little bit. I mean, musicians get in each other's hair. That happens. And so I came back at the end of that, that second summer, 84, and then it was 86 for two months. And I came back and that's, and I'd said, basically, I I took the Panama hat, like in the movie Crossroads, you know, I had a (laughs) stupid Panama hat, like, like the Ralph Macchio figure, uh, lightning boy, you know, and, and I put it up on the shelf and I go, it's time to get a straight job. I'm done. The, The busking thing was great. I feel it, you know, in my heart, but it's time to get a straight job. I can't support myself on the streets. And of course, at that moment, I'm driving through Harlem. I'm a seven dollars an hour, you know, t- uh, tutoring in in a in a college in the South Bronx, and that is the moment when I see him. And that's when the whole story starts. So, the Satan and Adam documentary doesn't tell you any of that two and a half years. It just sort of makes it out like I the, lose the girlfriend, go and find Mr. Satan. But there was a lot of a lot of stuff in between, and. I, there's a lesson here, and I'm always trying to draw the lesson. Again, for the harmonica players in your audience, it's a journey. It's not just taking lessons, as important as they are, so that you can study with Tomlin, and that's crucial. I studied with Nat Riddles. But it's a journey. It's not an easy, it's, it's a journey that may have many more stages than you realize. And the learning t- takes various forms. Including like not including thinking it's all over, thinking you're done, and then having it reanimate, and suddenly your passion is back. Um, and I was fascinated by that whole by that process. Um, but anyway, that's 
that's a long way to answer to your question. No, it's it's uh, it's interesting that kind of idea of the journey. I I always talk about it as a as a relationship. You know, you're, you're kind of uh, mm-hmm. forging a relationship with the instrument, and and it's exactly the same as as forging any kind of meaningful relationship. It it's a long term thing, and uh, you know sometimes yeah. it's not going to be at the forefront of your attention. Um, and yes, <laughs> you know, it, 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 I don't practice every day. <laughs> Yeah, you're right. Jo- well, I used to, I used to, I keep, the, I used to keep a journal in those days. I was an, I don't do it anymore at all. But I, I was in every day, keep a journal, and I would have these moments that you might have with a girl, girlfriend, where I go like, I'm falling out of love with the harmonica, and you feel guilty or you feel like, whatever the opposite. It's not heartbroken. It's like I used to feel something for this music. What? And then some other door opens and the feeling is back. And it's funny how that works. Yeah. But it's, yeah. it's something that every musician experiences. And, and I think that's something that I'm always yeah. trying to, when, when I see a student experience it for the first time, I, I'm really trying to kind of let them know that it's okay. And, it, and it's okay to, to take that little break and it's not over. Um, but it's, it's quite a, a difficult experience the first time mm-hmm. of kind of falling out of love or uh, the, the frustration, the first brick wall that you hit, um, especially yeah. if you've been lucky enough not to hit brick walls right from the beginning. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I agree completely. I, I, you know, and I'm sure you get this question from people who will say, you know, I feel, I feel kind of stale. Mm-hmm. I feel like I'm like I'm running out of ideas when I go to a jam session, I can do that first chorus on a 12 bar shuffle in G. And then I get to that halfway through the second chorus and suddenly I feel like I'm doing the same licks or, or just a more general kind of malaise, you know, a sort of, I'm, I'm just, I'm getting stale. And you know what my answer to that is? I always have, there's a couple of different answers and, and there's three answers actually. Number one, Mr. Satan used to say, I will not be a slave to my guitar, you know? So, so he would, he meant basically, I'm not going to feel obligated to practice all the time. When I want to play, I will play. That's one answer. The, the, the second answer is learn a new song. You know, I think harmonica players, sometimes the occupational hazard is we just kind of jam or we improvise. Learn a melody. And, and for me, some of the most exciting times on the harmonica were the moments when I was trying to take something that was, it was not harmonica music actually, that was the interesting thing. I'm gonna, I'm looking around for my A flat harp if I can find it. But it was the moment, yeah. So the moment when I, when I, for whatever reason, a particular song, like Superstition, in my case it was Superstition was one of the first that I remember. And also um, uh, Sanford and Son, the Sanford and Son theme called The Street Beater. But Superstition, I, 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 rem- I still remember sort of, and this is like 2010, this is that period when I was just about, or 2009 actually, I had just become a one-man band, and I heard the, You know, you don't have to do exactly what Stevie Wonder is doing on the clavichord. If you can get the feeling of it, the flavor of it, translate it to harmonica. So I would encourage if somebody's running out of something, say, well, what's a song? Maybe it's not blues for you. You know, that's the other thing is maybe you're tired of the old blues and maybe you should try to do um, uptown funk. Mm-hmm. <laughs> go in, we're in such a lucky time. You can go to YouTube and put in uptown funk guitar part. And you'll find three or four w- versions. I play guitar too. And I'm amazed. We didn't have that stuff. We had to figure it all out. And you can watch some of the stuff they do. And maybe you can figure out a guitar version of a pop tune that, ha- that happens to touch you. I, I, I am a firm believer in follow, follow your bliss. That's what the, the, the psychologist Joseph Campbell, the guy who write, wrote about myths, the hero's journey. Follow your bliss. Follow your passion. Trust Maybe it's not blues that's calling to you now. Maybe it's something else. Um, I know Jason Ritchie used to talk about, he's a skateboarder, you know, the, the, the sort of spins that a skateboarder does. I play table tennis, and I think like a table tennis player sometimes, the, the, the tight, you know, blues and those things. So maybe there's, 
if you're stale, maybe there's some source of energy that's right there that could be pulled into your that could be pulled into your playing. Let me give you one more example. <laughs> as a dis, as a distance runner, I've I've gone out there. I still remember the morning I went out and I was trying to learn Matchbox Blues. Um, uh, let me let me um Matchbox Blues. <laughs> And I and I went and did like a ten mile run, and I was just it was the perfect the cadence boom, and I just I kind of worked out the harp part in my mind once I got that groove because I was trying to solve like what do you do on the four chord, you know? It, you know, it's and I was trying to like does is that right or should I do? And you can just maybe it's a question of going out and walking if you're stale and finding something that just moves through you like a beat and, and working it out. So I think there's so many ways, it's a long-winded answer again to how to get over staleness, but I think there's so many ways of bringing energies in from other places. Yeah, definitely. And the thing that I, I notice with practice is, is that you very rarely see the result of the work on the day that you're doing it. You know, you kind of, oh, yeah. it's it's days later, it's weeks later, it's months later. And if you don't know that, you think, shit, I'm not getting better. But, but you know, if you're, if you're used to that routine of making an improvement and then having a long period of working to get the next improvement and not seeing anything mm. happen. Um, yeah, it's a, it's quite, quite a kind of up and down journey. Certainly for, for me, it has been. <laughs> Well, I know that from being from being a runner, it's that you're always training. If there's a race, you know, that's months off, I, I, you know, I, I know what each workout's going to do and how recovery is important. But I also know it's going to take a while for the results to show up. I always tell people just try to learn one new thing a day, mm -hmm. just one one cool thing, one new solve one little problem and they'll add up. And, and, and eventually the, the big things will happen. They'll come along and they used to call that latent learning. I don't know if that's a term that, that's still a, a current. Latent learning, like, like your, your unconscious is working on stuff even when you're mm -hmm. asleep, so that if there's something you tried to do and couldn't quite do, the hardwire, it's almost like, you know, if you have a, a new Mac or something, it's like it takes a long time to migrate. Yeah. <laughs> Might take three or four hours for stuff to migrate, but eventually all that stuff will happen, and it'll, be, it'll have migrated into place, and you'll be able to do something that you that you didn't have the ability to do. I, 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 here's, I, I think about it as if I'm on tour, which I don't do a lot, the third gig. The first gig is kind of a shakedown, the second gig you're still working, but by the third gig, sometimes I'll start to do stuff on songs like Crossroads Blues where I, or, that are really chops heavy, where I really need to have a lot at my, and I'll feel like there's stuff at my fingertips. It's like, oh, look what I've got that I didn't expect to have. Now, I think people who are playing all the time, that's just, they play from that. But for me, the, the three hours that you're playing night one, the three hours that you're playing night two, that's just like an intense practice session. And you're also trying, it's like you're doing your second serve on day one, right? You're, the, the serve that's pretty good and that mm -hmm. sometimes gets you points, but it's not, it's not like the really new creative hard thing. And it's only when you really have all that in there, then you can relax into like, and, and do the thing that surprises you. Yeah. And I love that that can happen too. Um, Definitely. But it doesn't, it doesn't always show up when you want it to, but, but often it's that third gig. It's often not, it, you can't, str you can strain on the first gig, but that stuff's not going to quite happen usually. That's my feeling. No, I, I think that that's, that's really true. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm interested because you, you know, you said that, that you've got to follow your bliss and, and maybe mm -hmm. uh, kind of, kind of see, see, see where kind of the, uh, your imagination takes you. But I, I'm wondering if there's been a period in your life where you've been kind of hyper-focused and, and very methodical with your practice and learning, or has it always been a bit more whimsical? Well, no, it's interesting. Um, and, and of course, 
for me, I mean, there have been times where when I became a, when I remanufactured myself into a one man band, which if you go back, you can sort of see the videos I put up where I'm doing crossroads and there's, um, there's like a fo- there's just the amp is on camera. It's not even me. It's just an amp and I'm playing crossroads blues. And in, starting in 2009, I, when I became a one man band, it was like, a the closest I've had to a kind of renaissance. I've had several different versions of renaissance, but it was the first time in the post Satan and Adam period, the period where I was really off on my own and, and not playing with him, where I felt like I was suddenly doing my own thing. Not like, a, like, like something that I would be remembered for as opposed to being remembered for playing with him and being kind of a strong second side man where suddenly I'm, I'm, the, I'm the show. And it was during that period that I did, I actually made a conscious decision. I've talked about this in, in, uh, several, in several different venues. Um, I made a conscious decision that I, that I was going to need to play really fast 16th notes if I wanted this song to work. And, our, and it just so happened that, that Jason... Richie had come by Oxford and played a gig in town, which is the only time he's ever done that. And I had gone and I videotaped, literally videotaped him. And um, and then ha- I had a metronome and it was like, he's at 135. I posted it. I've changed the title of the video, but you can go and find it. It's in 2009, I believe in it. It's Jason. Rid- it's the, one of the few bits of video that I have of him live. It's incredible stuff back then. And he was in his prime, and he's still in his prime, but he had figured something out about how to really do create creative, fast stuff at a very high tempo. And so I said, I'm going to learn how to do this. Not equal him, but now that he's raised the roof, I'm going to take my metronome. And I, and I said it, I kind of tried to do what I, whatever I could do on 16th notes. And I started with something he'd showed me. And then, of course, you end up somewhere, if you, if you add an extra note, you end up somewhere you didn't expect to be. So I, I began to simply exercise with it at that tempo and then slowly crank the tempo up. It's the most deliberate I've been. It was strictly like a speed thing. Mm-hmm. And I'd crank the tempo up to the point where I just was on the edge and couldn't quite control it. Then I'd go down a little bit and figure that's, my, that's the maximal effective. It's like with running, the maximal aerobic pace. I'm not going into oxygen debt. I'm, you know, I sort of like, I can handle that. I can do that at a, a sustainable tempo. And then I would practice at that tempo. And then I'd back it down, way down. And then I would begin to do the same kind of 16th note runs. But at that point, technically, they were no problems. So the example might be, if, if maximal was like, I would go, which for me was then not that hard technically. What was tricky was then I could reach for stuff and I might even do it slower than that. And I might begin to really try to think musically. And so I evolved, you say, sort of conscious practice or deliberate practice. That's how I did it. And then I would back it up once again, push it to the point. And at a certain point I got so that I actually could, I don't know if I could create at 135, you know, but beats per minute or whatever that was. But I could, but it wasn't like, it didn't feel the same. That it, 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 it didn't feel as crazy as it felt when I first got there. So that's a very mechanistic kind of way of, of thinking about music. And, and, and this is a really important point, which is, that's like shredding. So what I did was consciously train myself like a, like a shred metal guitarist to be able to play fast stuff. Mm-hmm. But that's not, at the very moment that I was doing that, and it was important to the song, and all that practice shows up in the track. If you listen to the track, it's six and a half minutes long. Actually, the original recording was about seven and a half. We cut out a couple of choruses. And it was like, and I, but I had all the chops needed to do exactly what I was feeling, which is important. But there's a whole other way to play music. And, and the person I would direct people to is, is uh, Jimmy Lee, who's the, one of the greatest rack players in the world. And his musicianship, he has plenty of technique, but he has a kind of musicality and a kind of soulfulness that I just, I envy if I, I, I would envy it if I was an envious person because it's, it's just beyond, it's, be, it's something I don't have in the, in the way that he has it, a kind of effortless ability to feel a melody. It, like Col- Coltrane had that. Mm-hmm. Coltrane just, 
and Miles Davis had that <laughs> at, at that level. Uh, you know, I'm not, I don't have, I don't have that thing. And when I hear it, I recognize it and honor it. But my point being basically, don't think that just with the working with the metronome and trying to go super fast is the one way to be deliberate. You can go in an entirely different way and you can get a room or a space that, that sounds really good. And then you can begin to listen to the space between phrases. That's another, a, a totally different way of thinking, which is I'm not going to try to cram as many notes into, into a time sequence as I can, but I'm going to play and then I'm going to start to edit and I'm going to start to see how things feel when I leave notes out. And I think maybe you can find, maybe both those directions are good directions to think about going in. Um, that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that, that methodology. Um, I, I, I try to think about my practice. Like I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very analytical person by nature. Uh, and so I, I, I break down my practice yeah. into uh, technique, repertoire and improvisation practice. And, and I try and weight my practice sessions evenly between those three things. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and, and it's still, you know, it's very methodical, whatever I'm working on. And then the, the crucial thing is there's the transition between practice time and play time. And those are, yeah. those are two totally different things and, and they're supposed they to be are. different. Um, yeah. Do you, do yes. you kind of have that, uh, that sort of, do you let yourself just, just muck around? Well, I, I'll, can I be honest? I'll sure. tell you something I've never told you. Yeah. Most of my time is just mucking around. Um, it, unless I'm trying to, if I'm trying to figure out a song, like I remember very specifically trying to figure out Sanford and Son and trying to translate that. And I have a version of that that's, that's out somewhere. It's, I think I put it on a YouTube video, but it was on my second album, Southbound. Um, let me just play the beginning so people know. I, trying to, so that was an example of where I quite deliberately sort of sat there and painstakingly tried to translate what I was hearing. Um, it, it uses a C harp and an F harp. And so, and, and, but you know, you try something and then, you know, that's not quite right, is it? And then you go, you go on YouTube and try to find somebody who's diagrammed it on guitar. And I know just enough about reading music that I can say, okay, I see that. want to stop on that you know how many you know how many hours it took to figure that out you know and then it's and then it's like uh, and i just you know point is the point is so but those moments are not like most of the time I just pick up a harp and what I may do is I may work. I may, if I'm getting ready for a gig, I, I, honestly, it's, I practice a lot when I have gigs coming up, if I'm getting ready for a gig. What I might do is I might go through the song list at this point. Uh, as far as the quality of whatever show I put on, it's going to be at least as much about the vocals as it is about the harmonica. So, so one thing that I'll do is I'll just, I'll just look, pull out my song list. And I'll just sing and play. And the the song with the groove, you know, the song in a groove will sort of pull everything back into focus. What that doesn't do is it doesn't give me kind of new roots. It, it, it allows certain songs that have never really been a part of my repertoire, like Summertime, to languish, uh, insufficiently woodshed it. I, I wonder, I, I assume you know what I mean. There are mm -hmm. songs we all have that if we were at a jam session and somebody called it out, it would be entirely appropriate to think that this famous harp guy knows how to play Summertime, and I can limp my way through it. Um, but I, I, there, I have a category of songs like that where I say, God, someday I really need to woodshed on that, you know? Um, and I, and I don't at, at this point, I, I wish I did. I wish I did a little more, but I've got other things that suck my attention away. No, that's, uh, that's fair. Uh, I, one thing I do want to ask about, about getting ready for gigs, do you find that you have to mm -hmm. kind of get into sort of, uh, match fitness to play those first 16th note runs? Um, or is that, is that always still there? Well, it's interesting. Yeah. It, it, What's amazing, what always amazes me is, 
I mean, I can go a week without touching a harp. I just want people to understand that at this point in my life, sometimes I do that. Um, but, but I, it's still, I can, you know, 92% of it is still there. And I'm always amazed at how much I, I've retained. Um, there are certain songs like Thunky Thing where, w- that are just harder. And, that, that, and so actually those are the things that if I want to really get back in fitness, I know the things I have to do. I know the songs I have to do in order to get back in fitness. In fact, one of the things that I do, um, and, and it's just chop strength, literally. You know, if you, if you I mean, Tom and Lucky doesn't do this, but if you put a harp down for a week and then you go and try to play some <laughs> high note stuff, you know, you're, you're, you start to, your lips start to get that burn and you go, oh God, I've lost chop strength. Ah, so I will do something like this. Um, <laughs> just do so that that little exercise it has the in and out chord thing the groove sort of holding down the groove the the bent three with a little four in it so you're sort of doing some bends some single note some single note things so it sort of has a lot of everything and then the big tongue blocking thing when i go up and 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 i'll just i'll do that for a while Not not a long while but i'll do it i'll do it on a couple of different key harps I think that's an incredibly important thing, actually, is if your default harp tends to be a C or a B flat or an A, but you're going to be playing a gig where you're playing the higher harps, it's really important, obviously, to be warming up. And so, I, again, if I'm trying to draw a lesson for your, your audience, I would say on a weekly basis, make sure that your practice goes from at least an A up to an F, maybe down to, from a G up to an F. But, I mean, you should have it's really important to move around on the harps. And I think sax players who, who do multiple instruments like tenor and alto, you know, I mean, and there are, you know, professional musicians who are sax players who play all, you know, three of them play the soprano too. They obviously don't just spend all their time on the tenor. <laughs> you got to move. And, that, and, and with the harp, but the G harp and an F harp have little in common in terms of the, 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 the particular way you need to deploy your lip strength in order to make the notes, um, in order to make the bends right. So that's one of the things that I, that I do. I also, I really trying to work on the bends. In other words, one of the first things I would do getting ready for a gig, getting back in practice would be to just play the blue scale. And of course that note sticking a little, I've noticed that recently. So I'll just, I'll move around on, on those sort of basic but important kind of bluesy melodies, making sure that the blue scale sounds good. I'll go up, and of course I'll overblow. Or I'll go. What'll start to happen, and it happened a little bit there for me, is that when I do things that are basically just relatively mechanical patterns, sometimes my my musical imagination, which is fairly primitive in some ways, will go, oh, da 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 da. So it's taken a, a little motif, a rhythmic motif like da 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 da, and then it'll start to do permutations of it. In other words, I think one of the most important, one, one important element of improvisation is those sort of little internal conversations, mm-hmm. the sort of something that again gets varied this way, the sort of versionings. I've heard the term versionings. You know, you kind of version something and, and you never know whether it's going to be what, what part the, the rhythmic element of the melody. In that case, I quickly di- you know, um, analyzed it for your audience, da, 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 da. One, two, three, four, five, six. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of, I'll try to go with that 
and and that's how my practice often ends up with me just sort of, just sort of lost in the sauce, you know, kind of doing a melody like that. And, and then every once in a while, I'll stumble into something that after all these years, I, I've never played before, something brand new. Mm-hmm. Um, it might be a blow arpeggio, like a Paul DeLay type. Uh, one years ago, let me try that one more time. So it involved a couple of um, jumping up, which is a bebop technique that Sugar Blue actually uses, sort of jumping up on an offbeat to a higher note. Da, 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 right? And, and I'll stumble across something like that and I'll go, wow. And then I'll try to do it again and maybe record it if I have a little voice recorder. That's such an important thing, I think, is the vo- a voice recorder. A little, um, Olymp- I have a little Olympus or Olympia, whatever it's called, Olympus, I think. Um, so... Anyway, sorry, long, long no, no, answer. No, don't, no, don't be sorry. I, I have to correct you uh, very briefly because you said that, you know, Tomlin Leckie doesn't ever not practice. And, and unfortunately, that, that's not true. <laughs> and, and I know that I always tell my students to guarantee me at least five days a week of practice. But uh, there are periods. Yes. Um, but that, that goes back to what we were saying earlier about it being a relationship. There are times when it's not the most important thing uh, at, at, mm-hmm. at that moment. And that's that's totally fine. Um, right now I'm, I'm having such a blast, uh, cause I'm not going out and meeting people for coffee and stuff, which I'm missing like crazy, but instead I am just living in first position, but playing kind of three octaves, first position blues, um, wow. which has just been something I've, I've not bothered getting, getting comfortable with. And it, it annoys me, me so yeah, much. Me <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. One of those. I'm the same way. It's underwood shedded stuff for me. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, it's it's fun. Um, the the weird thing. Just I I'm, I need to tell tell you because I'm I've, I've told my wife too many times and she doesn't really get how exciting this is for me. Um, but I I popped a tongue blocked overblow uh, the other day, and. Wow. And then I popped it again. It's not pretty, but it's there. So that's that's the next uh, thing to refine. Oh uh, gosh. <laughs> yes. And so my my governing myth has always been, yeah. The reason I don't tongue block full time is because you know when you overblow, you know, no full time, no no full time tongue blocker really is an overblower, and that still may be true, but there may be cracks in that in that mythology. So um, I wonder if I can do that. So if I have a C harp, I did it. Uh, but I did it on the six. How do you like that? Yeah. Hey, you know, I've got, can I, can I share just a little bit of news with your audience? Go for it. This is, if this falls into the sort of, what do you, what kind of projects are you in, involved with now? I, I have such an, it's such an unusual story and it does have one thing out that people could look at potentially buy, but you can also just play, um, which is one t- entirely unexpected outgrowth of the fact that there's this documentary, Satan and Adam about my duo, out on Netflix in America and available as a DVD. And it's been there since June of last year. One totally unexpected development is that I got an email from a guy named Rod Patterson who said, I'm Sterling McGee's nephew. And I said, really? And he said, yeah. He goes, and I, you know, I saw the documentary and he goes, I'd love to get together. He goes, I, I've been, I can sing my uncle's songs. He can, I can sing Sterling McGee's songs, the Satan and Adam songs. I said, really? And we ended up having a conversation, and it turned out that he had lived, uh, that Sterling, Mr. Satan, had lived with Rod and Rod's mother, who was Sterling's sister, right, Um, when Rod was a teenager for a couple of years after he'd become Mr. Satan. So he sort of had a breakdown, and he was figuring out how to move ahead, but he was playing blues at that point and did some house parties down in St. Petersburg, Florida, where Rod was living at the time. Well, Rod currently lives in Atlanta. Long story short, Rod, we decided we were going to get together, my blues doctors duo and Rod, and we were going to basically do some Satan and Adam songs and just record maybe a demo. He came to Mississippi and, 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 and drove six hours and came and we recorded basically eight, eight songs in two days, most of an album, and sort of sat back. Um, it's like a one night stand. You sort of sit back and go, well, what, what's just happened here? This is <laughs> supposed to happen, right? And, and like within 
two weeks, we decided that it was going to become Sir Rod and the Blues Doctors. We went through a couple of names, but like we suddenly decided that he was going to be our frontman, and that we were going to make an album, complete the album. We had a second, um, a second session. We did some Satan and Adam tunes that I had not performed since I last played them with Sterling. We'd done songs like I Want You and Seventh Avenue and Sanctified Blues and a, a couple of others. We did a, a James Brown tune. Um, Rod was a, he's kind of a slightly hip hop styled motivational speaker in Atlanta um, with all these skills. Like he's an incredible designer. He's designed all the artwork for the album and it looks incredible. The album itself won't come out we're holding it in the can right now because, of course, it's a really weird time to release yeah. music. But we have a single out. Our, this, and the single was one that I had done with Alan as a, just a four-chord progression. It was like, it was like A, A, C, D, F. A four-chord kind of blues rock progression that we had jammed on three years ago and put a video on YouTube. And, and I t the day before Rod came back for the second session, I said, brother, and this is crazy, but you know, there's this song we did three years ago, Alan and I, and it has 278 likes and zero dislikes, or one dislike. I said, I have nothing else like that. It tells me there's some power, and it felt good when we did it. So I sent it to him. The next day, he arrives with lyrics. He has written a song, and the song is available on YouTube. You can just go to, it's called Come Together. It's not the Beatles tune. It's our own tune, but that's the title. So you just put in Sir Rod Blues Come Together and you'll find three different versions, three different, like one is just yellow and it's it's just the single and then there's a couple of video versions that we have. Um, cool. Kind of cheapo, cheapo video versions. But um, we're really excited. There's uh, Just when I talk about what it's like to have a front man who can really sing and he, unbelievable dancer, this man is 54 and he can still do full 180 splits Wow. He can go down like James Brown. He's been doing shows in nursing homes, schools in nursing homes. That's not a growth industry right now in the <laughs> middle of a pandemic. There, he's, all the business is gone, you know. But he's been doing these shows, and he began, it's such a strange story, because he can really sing blues. But that was not his primary thing. He was a church guy, and then he was doing karaoke, where he would lip sync James Brown, Marvin Gaye, Michael Jackson, and Sam Cooke. And about four years ago, people said, they heard him singing something, and they said, well, you should really be singing. Don't just lip sync and dance. You know, you really sing. So he's been doing that for four years. Does not sound like it would quite work. Like, and then he's been woodshedding with Satan and Adam music. But, and so the melodies, when he got into the studio with us, and I'm doing these songs, it just felt like, oh my God, this is so uncanny. Because I, the vocal melodies, he wasn't just imitating his uncle. He was reanimating the songs with a lot of the vocal elements of his uncle, but it was his own sound. And so at some point, people can look for Sir Rod and the Blues Doctors, but that's how we are billing ourselves. And I'd uh, love people. We're on Spotify with that one song, Come Together. So look for us, please. Podcast people, please help Adam <laughs> Gusso out. <laughs> and, and just put us in playlists if you like the song. It's, a, it's an unusual song. Cool. And it's really about bringing people together. Well, um, I, I didn't tell you this at the beginning, but anything that you, you've mentioned is getting put in the show notes so people will be able to just go to those and click cool. the link straight through. Um, cool. So, yeah, I will put that in there as well. And it's, it's exciting that you're uh, working on a new musical project. Is it nice having yeah. someone else singing again? Does that, does that feel quite freeing? It really is, yeah. Um, well, it's funny because in the Blues Doctors, Alan and I split vocal duties, and it's just me playing harmonica and foot drums, and him playing guitar, and then we we go back and forth with the songs. If it, at such time as the pandemic actually is through, and and a, and a 62 year old and a 68 year old, which is the Blues Doctors, can go out safely on the road, we want to go out with Sir Rod and the Blues Doctors. At that point, what's the show going to be? Well, I, I think we'll open up like the way the James Brown band might do, you know, where the band or BB King's band, the band does a mm -hmm. couple, two or three, four, <laughs> and then you bring the star on. And, and then we won't, I won't be singing. So, but I, you know what? I am completely fine because it's so fun with Rod. It's such a natural position for me to be in that sort of strong number two. And I like, I mean, I'm sitting at the drums and Alan's not particularly demonstrative. So to have a guy who is really dynamic, and we've got a couple of YouTube clips that you can find that were sort of, we did one show live. Our first live show is 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 um, 
the International Blues Challenge, like a special, like a set in the middle of something. Like, why would anybody go to Beale Street in the middle of the IBCs to do their first live show? Well, it was a couple of rough spots, but, you know, it was okay. Um, but yeah, it's fine. I, I, I really like supporting him. What I'm reminded of, though, is with Satan and Adam, just how much harp I was playing behind Sterling. Um, give you one example. One of the songs that we cover is Seventh Avenue. And so this is the harp part that I'm doing for the entire song. playing drums now with sterling i was just playing the harp part and he was doing the drum drums now that i'm doing that and you know i'm a distance runner but there's <laughs> there's a limit i don't want to go into the red zone and, and i'd say i was i'm getting closer to the red zone on that song than i thought i would um but so am i having fun yeah and i can't wait to go and 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 show people i mean i can't wait to actually see what we're like live we've only done one live show and rod was so dynamic a dancer that one of the f ups was that Alan was like watching. Alan lost the groove because he was watching what Rod was doing. So that tells you something about the kind of front man we've got is that he messes up the guitar player. Um, uh, that's very so, cool. Yeah. Oh, I'm I'm really excited to to hear hear the new project. Um, so yeah. that that kind of brings me to uh, a question that I've kind of been asking everybody that I've been chatting to yeah. is is being on lockdown is it is it an opportunity to work on things that you maybe wouldn't have had time to or kind of pushed pushed to the the side for a while is there something that you're kind of getting into at the moment well you know what's really funny of course you know i i'm a university professor and so part of what this lockdown has coincided with was me having to figure out how to teach online and so i'm making these video lectures for my students about various, various things in the courses that I'm, two courses that I'm teaching. That has taken a lot of time. But there's one other thing, which is that f foolishly, back in September, I agreed, some, some, uh, 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 a, a top scholar said, I'd like you to be part of this special issue on cotton that we're doing. Would you write an essay on cotton and the blues? And I thought, sure, you know, <laughs> September, deadline next May. May 1st, what's today? <laughs> We're in late April. So I haven't started writing. I've done all the research. I've got enough research done for a book now, but I'm sort of just getting ready. And so what, what I've been doing is collecting not only every song I could find, blues composition that references Cotton. There's not a lot of them, but there's enough. I've certainly got a couple of dozen probably. Um, but then all of these interviews and going through memoirs and, and back issues of Living Blues magazine, trying to understand what I'm trying to do is take that cliche, well, blues comes from the cotton fields, and say, is that true? To the extent that it is true, how is it true? Um, is it all bad news? Are there good things that happen to, and when blues musicians talk about their relationship with cotton fields and with music, what, what, like, what's, the, what's the true story? And, and I'm just trying to sketch that out. And it's a really interesting, it's, I'm, I'm finding some surprising things. And one thing that comes through um, is that it's not all bad. Of course, everybody wanted to get out of the cotton fields. There's no question that for most of them, well, not everyone, because Bilbo, Robert Bilbo Walker ended up moving out to Bakersfield, California. And he brags in, in one issue of Living Blues, he says, I've got everything that I, the stuff that I used to work on for the man, I now own it all myself. He goes, I love farming. <laughs> so owning yourself as opposed to being a sharecropper or somebody else becomes a really interesting thing. But other people talk about how much cotton they picked and, and you know, beating other people at picking cotton. And they talk about the music in the fields, but also Howlin' Wolf. Some people talk about being beaten by their parents and made to be in the cotton fields. One of the most interesting things is that two of the most creative Mississippi blues musicians, Charlie Patton, um, well, Howlin' Wolf and Robert Johnson, actually. Uh, Howlin' Wolf was beaten by his, one, his stepfather. They were both beaten by their stepfathers. 
And they both of them said, I'm going to get the heck out of here because I want to play this music and I don't want to be in those stuck in those fields. So blues may come from the cotton fields, but it may also be something that's produced by people wanting to run away from the cotton fields mm. and going off and making blues as an alternative, what I call the blues alternative to compelled labor. So what am I doing in this time of, I, I'm trying to write an essay and uh, harmonica is sort of there too. It's also for me, it's a time to, to do YouTube videos that are focused on how we can woodshed effectively. So I, I would urge your listeners, if, they, if they're not familiar with uh, my my sort of newer YouTube channel. I think it's called Gusso's Classic Blues Harmonica Videos, the monetized channel. Um, uh. please, my apologies if the ads that show up are for some some hor horrible right-wing organization <laughs> that says basically the mainstream media is lying to you. It's I keep on thinking, God, I don't want those ads. I don't, you know, I don't want. That's the world Americans live in. You you may get different monetizations if you if you go to them, but I've been talking a lot about woodshedding. And That's cool. So I've been making more videos, I would say, than than usual. So, well, that, hey, that's, well, a, that's a positive thing. You know? <laughs> it is a positive thing. It is a positive thing. So, well, thanks for having me on this thing. I, I uh, you know, I we don't have a live audience, so they can't ask me questions. But um, I hope I hope I've answered that question. What I, it's cotton and blues for me all the way right now. That's cool. I mean, so it's, it's, that. it sounds like you might have enough for a book. And maybe that might be the next project rather than just an essay. I, I hate to say it. I think you might be right. I was <laughs> going to try to do a next book on something else. But I, I, this is actually more interesting than I expected. And now I've just got to write, for me, you know, only 15 pages. You know, it's like ten, you, we need 10 to 15 pages. I have much more than what I can do in that. So I don't know how I'm going to do it. But yeah, it's a book. <laughs> That's cool. Um, well, I think this is this is probably quite a good time to to wrap things up. Um, but yeah. uh, before we do, um, I've, I'm going to post everything that you've you've mentioned. Is there anything else that you you want people to to be checking out? Um, yeah, actually, there there's one thing that I haven't talked about yet in any venue, but I'll let you guys know because um, you're over in England <laughs> and the Americans won't know. No, is that I have a book coming out in the fall. Um, I have a, a, a brand new book, um, and in fact, there's, I don't think they have the cover image locked in yet, although they will soon, but it's on Amazon, and you can check it out and pre-order if you want. It's called Who's Blues? My original title was different, but they wanted to sex it up a little. Who's Blues? Facing Up to Race and the Future of the Music. And so I have a book coming out that is sort of an outgrowth of a series of videos I did back in 2012-13 called Blues Talk, and I have a page on my website. And I, I, it, it's sort of an outgrowth of that. And I'm, what I'm trying to do is take seriously, especially is probably more true in America than in the UK, some, the way in which there, there's, there's some racial tensions that have emerged in the contemporary blues scene in the last seven or eight years. Um, they, they come and go. Um, we're in a time of, of Americans kind of trying to go back through who we are as Americans. We're going back in the aftermath of the Black Lives Matter period, in the aftermath of what was called the 1619 Project for the New York Times, where we're sort of retelling the history of slavery, the Museum of Slavery and African American history. Um, there's, there, there's a sort of, so I talk about sort of two different ideologies. Number one is blues is black music, exclamation point, which to me misses the way in which blues is world music now. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, no black, no white, just the blues. That's sort of two memes that we've got, which I see the latter saying, no black, no white, just the blues, as a, a sort of admirable but partially misguided attempt to think in colorblind terms about the blues. And the problem is that it tends to erase specific African-American contributions to the music and, and, and black history and the, and the pains of black history. The book is about all that stuff. I think it's going to get a lot of attention. It's a very, it's, it's oriented not towards an academic audience, but towards a popular audience. And I've got 30, 35 photos of contemporary blues artists, black and white and Asian. Um, and um, so I hope people will think about that. And, you know, we should touch base maybe in the fall in October when it, when it comes out. Oh, that'd be Who's great. Blues? That'd be great. And yeah, it'd be, be great yeah. to get you back on and, uh, and do a round two and chat about some, some more stuff. Maybe, maybe chat, chat a little bit more about kind of early days of, uh, of, of Adam Gusso. Cause I think that that's quite an interesting sure. time period, but I'd love uh, to. brilliant. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. And, uh, Thanks, yeah, Tom. enjoy the rest of your day. Mm -hmm.
Take it easy. All right. Bye. Take care. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Tomlin's Harmonica Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a rating and review on your podcast player of choice. Join me next Monday for the next episode. Happy harping! <laughs>